Hey, uh, good day, everyone in Cyberland, for, and welcome for the distinguished talk by the IEEE, uh, Solid State Secret Society, and EBS South Brazil chapter. Uh, we are very uh, honored and pleased to have a uh, you know, distinguished speaker with us uh, today, uh, Professor Paulo Crovetti. And you know, let me advise you that in two weeks from now, we'll have a, another a distinguished talk uh, on. Uh, Secret design and, and RF and microfluidics. Uh, this uh, talk today uh, will be given by Professor uh, Paolo Crovetti from uh, Politecnico di Torino, is the Torino Polytechnic School University, and he'll be talking about analog processing by digital circuits, a subject that he's been very active on uh, for the last you know ten years, and uh, he has contributed a lot on the design very innovative and creative ideas. A few words about our distinguished speakers, Professor Paolo Crovetti. Um, he received the PhD degree in electronics and communications from Politecnico di Turin, in Italy, in 2003. Uh, he's a associate professor with the Department of Electronics and Telecommunications at Politecnico di Torino. Uh, he has contributed to our field of circuits uh, with many, many important articles and he currently has main research interest in the fields of analog, mixed signal, and power integrated circuit design. Uh, his recent activities will be, you know, some of them will be talk, talk today, are on non-conventional information processing techniques, allowing the fully digital implementations of analog functions uh, on uh, uh, digital uh, modules, and also on ultra low power IC design for the IoT applications. The senior member of the IEEE, and it uh, serves as subject uh, editor in chief of IET, Electronic Letters, in the area of circuits and systems. And uh, he's also an associate editor of the IEEE Transactions on a very large scale integration transaction on the other side. With no further ado, I uh, welcome everyone in Cyberland to, to our, uh, our YouTube channel. You should have subscribed, subscribe now. And I'll uh, give the floor now to our distinguished speaker, Professor Paolo Crovetti. Thanks. Uh, Ready for coming and being here with us uh, this day. Thank you, Sergio, for your introduction. Thank you a lot for giving me the opportunity to give this talk for the uh, South Brazil uh, solid state circuit electron device joint uh, chapter. Uh, as you uh, anticipated in this talk, I will talk uh, about uh, analog processing by digital circuits, that is, uh, an uh, uh, alternative approach to address uh, the challenges of the, the related to the implementation of analog uh, interfaces uh, in uh, IoT application by fully synthesizable integrated circuits. So let's start uh, with uh, the uh, background of the IoT. We know that IoT is probably one of the big challenges of the years to come. Uh, the vision that uh, uh, in which uh, uh, integrated circuits are embedded uh, everywhere so that require process and exchange useful information so that to act uh, as a nodes of a globally interconnected network. Uh, the implementation of this uh, paradigm uh, implies uh, very strong, uh, very stringent requirements to IC designs since uh, we are talking about uh, nodes uh, that are in the cubic centimeter down to the cubic millimeter scale so that to be placed everywhere they need to be energy autonomous for sure they cannot be uh, powered by the grid it means they should be powered by tiny batteries or energy vessels that means uh, practical applications that the power the average power consumption should be in the microwater range or even in the nanowatt range for very, very small nodes. Uh, this tight power constraint means, uh, together with the fact that the nodes are expected to be always connected, means that uh, uh, their operation should be highly reconfigurable. It should be possibly duty cycled or event driven and possibly some uh, strategies should be implemented so that uh, to perform uh, actions and to uh, 
consume power only when it is strictly required duty cycle operation or uh, energy quality scaling uh, uh, approaches last but not least a very important requirement for iot nodes is that the cost of the node should be very very low uh, as uh, in uh, it's expected that, that uh, the number of uh, interconnected nodes should be in uh, the uh, tens of billions range uh, in uh, the uh, years uh, to come. Uh, the uh, cost of the node should be very, very small. It means that uh, they should be implemented using mainstream uh, CMOS technologies. And it, is, it means also very important that the design cost should be minimized. When we consider these uh, requirements uh, and uh, we consider the um, how these requirements can be met by uh, analog integrated circuit design we uh, can uh, see that there are significant uh, challenges to be addressed since unlike digital ic's analog ic's do not take uh, advantage of geometrical scaling there is almost uh, no area uh, reduction if we move from uh, uh, less uh, if we move to uh, to advanced uh, to more advanced more scaled nodes and this means that the area of uh, analog becomes uh, more and more relevant in uh, more advanced technologies. Moreover, we have that uh, uh, nanoscale devices typically show uh, worse performance for what concerns analog applications, low intrinsic gain, maybe higher leakage. And uh, the same uh, power supply voltage scaling that is uh, required uh, when geometrical uh, scaling is, uh, is adopted. Uh, by reducing the swing of analog signals leads to a, a degradation of the signal to noise ratio. Uh, moreover, we have that uh, analog circuits uh, do not take uh, uh, advantage by, um, in terms of uh, power, by the reduction of the power supply voltage. Uh, and this uh, is not uh, just uh, related to the theory. Of course, there are limitations, the theoretical limitations to the minimum power consumption of our on analog blocks for a given signal to noise ratio, but the most critical limit is related to the fact that analog circuits need to be biased at a constant operating point. That means that voltage and current references are needed for proper biasing, and these circuits draw a constant current that Gives, uh, that gives rise to a floor to the power consumption of the node. Uh, moreover, uh, the uh, anal analog circuits uh, show a limited uh, reconfigurability, uh, or, a li uh, or if uh, they uh, are designed to be configurable, the design is more, uh, becomes more uh, complex, unlike digital circuits. And uh, very important, uh, the uh, analog design flow, which uh, is uh, in which uh, is in great part manual, requires uh, a significant uh, effort and man manpower. Moreover, more effort could be related uh, to uh, post fabrication calibration to improve uh, uh, matching, for instance. So it means uh, that uh, the um, design and fabrication costs for analog ICs are going to be uh, much more relevant compared to automatic uh, the automatic design flow that can be adopted for uh, for digital circuits all of these uh, uh, constraints that moved and uh, these limitations of analog circuits in recent years that is a constant trend towards solutions in which uh, uh, analog processing can be replaced by digital or mostly digital solutions for instance uh, i can mention uh, in uh, 2004 the introduction of the all digital uh, phase locked loop or, or in 2010 the introduction of the digital low dropout regulator uh, which uh, indeed are nowadays uh, quite uh, common building blocks uh, in uh, uh, IoT uh, applications. And uh, in view of this trend, one can uh, ask 
somebody has also uh, asked the, these uh, papers in uh, conferences uh, if uh, given uh, that analog circuits are more and more the bottleneck in terms of cost and performance uh, we wonder if we uh, really still need analog circuits in uh, the internet of things era and uh, the common answer to this question is that uh, yes we will always need uh, analog circuits at least in interfaces toward uh, a physical world that is uh, intrinsically analog in itself well i will start this uh, talk by challenging this uh, statement that we are living in uh, an intrinsically analog physical world and based on that i will propose several new ideas uh, to address the problem of uh, analog uh, interfaces in uh, uh, iot applications by uh, fully digital solutions so let's uh, start this um, some considerations of an intrinsically analog physical world are we sure that we are in an intrinsically analog physical world uh, we know that uh, the matter is discrete uh, is made of atoms this has been uh, suggested uh, more than 2000 years ago uh, and uh, nowadays is something that is absolutely an evidence we can see atoms in this slide you can see silicon atoms for instance at uh, the scanning tooling, tunneling uh, microscopy uh, also fundamental physical quantities like uh, uh, the charge of electron the uh, electromagnetic energy uh, are not uh, uh, continuous in in themselves we can think for instance to the uh, charge that is stored in a capacitor we commonly describe it as a, a an analog signal, a continuous signal, but uh, in practice, uh, if we consider that uh, electrical charges are discrete, uh, it could be probably more accurate to consider it uh, as uh, a discrete quantity. Okay. Now, not only in uh, nature, in uh, let's say the physical world, uh, the information is. Uh, encoded in the, the, the there is an intrinsic discrete structure but also in the very same way that which uh, uh, animals and also humans uh, encode and process information in their nervous system uh, the uh, their approach is substantially digital on the work of uh, Otkin and uh, Axley, uh, 1948, uh, we can observe that the activation of uh, neurons uh, is actually uh, made by uh, a sequence of pulses. So it can be considered as a digital signal. So we may conclude that uh, a, dis a discrete, that is a digital underlying structure, is uh, the basis of our analog feeling, of our analog experience. But uh, probably what is more relevant for our discussion on uh, analog interface is that information in itself is discrete. The, if we have uh, a noisy channel, uh, band limited noisy channel, as uh, Claude Shannon pointed out at the beginning of the past uh, century, uh, the maximum amount of information that we can transmit from the transmitter to the receiver, no matter if we use uh, analog or digital uh, signals to encode it, uh, is a finite uh, quantity. Since uh, analog signals are assumed, uh, are supposed to transmit an, inf an infinite information, it means that if we use analog encoding, actually we are necessarily losing some information. So by properly taking into account these uh, limitation this intrinsic limitation of information uh, actually and by uh, applying by designing uh, information communication processing systems uh, taking into account of that uh, this uh, uh, led to what we uh, call the digital revolution the digital revolution that has so deeply changed our uh, way uh, our, our lives but uh, the consideration that I want to put to your attention in this talk is that uh, the results of Shannon 
on the fact that the information is discrete do not apply just to uh, computers and to uh, communications, but they also apply to sensors, to actuators, and uh, to operational amplifier, to uh, amplifiers, to whatever we normally regard as analog systems. systems which are used as interfaces in the Internet of Things. A digital revolution for this interface has yet to come, and this is the approach that I would like to uh, propose uh, in, uh, in this talk and to explain. Uh, actually, uh, let me be more precise of about what I am going to talk about. Uh, I'm talking about uh, processing uh, arbitrary uh, electrical signals, which can be voltages or currents, uh, to get uh, arbitrary band limited and finite in amplitude, of course, uh, output signals uh, at a predetermined level of accuracy by using uh, a circuit that is a truly digital circuit. That means uh, a circuit in which uh, information is internally encoded uh, as a binary signal can be synchronous or asynchronous, can be combinational or sequential, can include registers, memories, finite state machines, without uh, using uh, digital gates uh, as analog circuits. That is, uh, for instance, we should not use uh, a CMOS inverter as, uh, as an amplifier. Okay. Possibly we can allow to include in this uh, uh, system minimal and non-critical passive network that can be regarded as part of the sensor of part of the equator, if you want. Okay. In this, uh, this is the approach that I have tried to follow in uh, the last uh, five uh, years of uh, research, and uh, I would uh, like to show the results. Uh, concerning how, by using this approach, um, this uh, fully digital implementation can be adopted from common world uh, analog building blocks, like uh, an analog differential circuit or a, a voltage reference circuit. Then I will also discuss about uh, a qubit stream uh, digital to analog conversion technique, which can be uh, very, very useful in uh, the practical application of uh, this uh, paradigm. So let's start uh, with uh, the digital-based analog differential circuit. Let's consider for this purpose uh, uh, an operational transconductance uh, amplifier. It's a key building block in analog electronics, as uh, uh, we all know, and is mostly used as an error amplifier in negative feedback circuits. Um, we all know that basically the circuit is expected to provide uh, an output current which is uh, uh, proportional to the difference between the voltages at the plus and minus terminal, and it is insensitive to the common mode component. For instance, it can be implemented uh, at transistor level by this uh, uh, simple uh, uh, simple circuit. If we want to try to translate this circuit into digital, the first step is uh, to start rather from uh, the circuit analysis, the small signal analysis, from a behavioral description of this circuit. That is something probably more close to the physical world. By following this uh, approach, we can uh, observe that uh, um, how does it work? How does this circuit uh, uh, work? Well, we can uh, consider that uh, the common mode uh, input uh, voltage, the signal component of the common mode input voltage is rejected by the input stage, since basically the common source node of the input devices track the common mode input and. Uh, this input is subtracted from the external input in the gate source voltages of the input devices, whose drain current is therefore affected just by the uh, differential input voltage. Okay, uh, and uh, the, the slope of the uh, of the 
differential uh, uh, current versus differential voltage characteristic is related, of course, to the device. And in an ideal uh, OTA circuit, we expect that the slope is high, as high as possible. So if we try to simplify this behavior, we can say that in this circuit, this circuit is intended to, pro to provide an output current that is plus the bias current if the input differential voltage is larger than zero and is uh, minus the bias current of the input stage if uh, the uh, input differential voltage is less than zero. In other words, if we consider the um, capacitive uh, uh, load that very often is applied as, as a load in this circuit, we can say that uh, the output needs to be increased when the differential output input voltage is greater than zero, and it should be decreased uh, when the differential voltage is less than zero. In other words, we can uh, encode the behavior of analog behavior of this block by this simple code. Let's uh, analyze this code and let's uh, uh, discuss how does uh, it imply. First of all, it implies that uh, we have to check if the differential voltage is larger than zero or it is less than zero. And then we have to consequently drive the output so that to increase it or so that to decrease it. Can we translate this into a digital function? Let's try to answer this question by considering two, by applying the input signals of our differential circuit to a couple of uh, digital buffers that are expected to have uh, an ideal threshold behavior. The output is zero if uh, the input is below the threshold, is uh, one, a logical one, if it is about the threshold. Okay, now the question is uh, can we decide if the dim differential input voltage is larger than zero or less than zero looking just uh, at the output, at the digital output of these uh, two buffers? Well, the answer is uh, if we check uh, all the possible uh, uh, values that can take these outputs, uh, we can uh, observe that um, if uh, the two outputs take two different uh, um, logical values, for instance, out plus is zero, out minus is, out plus is one, out minus is zero, we can, uh, of course, say that uh, the differential input voltage is greater than zero. Similarly, if out plus is zero and out minus is one, it follows necessarily that uh, the differential input voltage is uh, uh, less than zero. So if that just these two output uh, um, combinations uh, uh, would be allowed, uh, we could uh, implement uh, uh, the analogous, the digital analogous of uh, uh, um, operational transconductance amplifier uh, by driving an output stage so that to increase the output voltage when uh, out plus is one and out minus is zero. Uh, and to decrease the output differential voltage in, in the opposite case. That is implementing this uh, digital behavior. Actually, there is, uh, there is a problem. The problem is that uh, the uh, output of these two digital buffers uh, can be also 0, 0 and uh, 1, 1. Let's discuss what, uh, what does it mean when the outputs are 1, 1 or 0, 0. Actually, the output are 0, 1, and 1, 0 if the common mode input voltage is close enough to the trip point of the inverters. And in this case, the output, the, 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 the circuit can work as a, a, a operational transconductor amplifier. When the common mode voltage is either two is in any case too distant from the trip point, we have that uh, the dominant common mode uh, uh, input component basically makes the circuit blind with respect to the differential output component. By the way, in these two situations, we can retrieve from the logical value of the output some information, some valuable information about 
the uh, common mode output, the common mode input. If the outputs are one one, it means that the common mode input is great is larger than the three point. While if the outputs are zero zero, it means that the common mode input is less than the three point. And this information can be exploited so that to generate a compensation signal to be added. And in this case, I have shown the very the simplest way this can be implemented and to be added to the external uh, inputs so that to compensate the input common on voltage uh, and uh, make the circuit operate make the circuit operate in uh, in this condition okay this behavior is uh, can be find to be analogous to the behavior of the differential pair in the traditional uh, operational transconductance uh, amplifier uh, implementation, where the common mode is subtracted from the external input to give the gate source voltage of the input devices. Okay. Now. If we put together the output stage that is driven when the information brought by out plus and out minus about the external input is valid and put together the common mode compensation circuit, we can have a digital based analog differential circuit. Actually, the correct operation of the circuit can be uh, simulated. Actually, what happens is that uh, the out plus and out minus uh, uh, signals oscillate between the uh, 0, 0 and 1, 1 state. But uh, in the transition, when they transition the uh, trip point of the inverters, there is a, a short time interval. There is a kind of uh, amplitude to time conversion in which uh, the logic level of the two outputs is different and in which the output stage is driven properly, as it can be shown here. Just in these time intervals, the output stage is driven. If we apply, connect this circuit in a negative feedback configuration and we apply appropriate input signals, we can observe that actually this circuit works and behaves as a operational transconductance amplifier okay this circuit has been studied i will not spend i have not much time to enter into details but it can be observed that the analog performance of this circuit can be uh, translated can be related uh, to the uh, digital performance of the digital gate and gates employed in it. In particular, uh, the um, unit uh, gain uh, frequency is related to the delay of the common mode compensation loop, and the gain is related to the um, is related to the ratio between the rising uh, times of the common mode compensation loop and the, the uh, output stage. We can also say that uh, as a, for an ideal OTA, the ideal behavior uh, corresponds uh, to the assumption that uh, the analog, the, the, the amplification tends to infinity. For this kind of amplifier, the ideal behavior corresponds to the condition in which uh, the delay and the rise fall times go to zero. This circuit has been actually um, implemented. We at the very beginning, I'm talking about uh, seven years ago, uh, 2013. Uh, I have implemented it using uh, off-the-shelf uh, components, and what is uh, quite uh, surprising is that it, it works 
as expected properly, even taking off the shelf digital uh, components. Of course, the performance uh, are not, uh, the performance is not uh, excellent, but uh, this uh, proves, uh, this is uh, a proof of concept that proves that uh, this uh, analog function can be implemented in digital terms. Now let's go ahead and let's uh, consider the implementation of this um, uh, circuit, the real integrated circuit implementation of this concept. Uh, more recently, this has been uh, done by PhD student uh, of uh, mine. It's been implemented in uh, the same concept in 180 nanometer CMOS. And uh, the uh, resulting circuit has been uh, uh, shown to operate uh, as an operational transconductance amplifier at uh, working down to 300 millivolt VDD and driving a capacitive load up to 80 picofarad with less than 5% distortion and consuming just 2 nanowatt power, yielding figure of merits that are absolutely competitive if compared to uh, operational uh, transconductance amplifiers working at such a low uh, power supply voltage below 500 millivolts. And another very interesting thing is that porting this uh, concept uh, to an advanced, uh, tech more advanced technology node from 180 nanometers to 40 nanometers, what happens is that all the figures of merit improve. It's very consistent with the digital operation of this uh, of this. Uh, mm -hmm. Recently, we have uh, also um, taped out uh, this idea and we had preliminary uh, results, uh, measured results, which uh, confirm the, uh, simulation, uh, the simulation results. And we have also extended um, the concept uh, basically by replacing uh, the uh, input uh, um, summing network which was made by resistors that are not conveniently integrated in uh, integrated circuit technologies so with uh, Muller C gates. We obtained uh, an uh, amplifier that is based on the same concept uh, whose operation can be described by a, style, a stated tran transition diagram as a finite state machine. And uh, we have uh, uh, already measured the uh, performance of this uh, uh, prototype uh, that uh, reports uh, uh, operation down to 300 millivolt uh, is suitable to drive 150 picofarad with uh, less than 2% THD, uh, shows uh, the lowest uh, power consumption among uh, amplifiers uh, working at such uh, low uh, PDD. Uh, the lowest silicon area and uh, achieves uh, again the mass, the, the, the best figure of merit uh, below 500 millivolt uh, VDD. The uh, DC gain is uh, still uh, 30 dB, that is comparable with uh, amplifiers working at the same supply, but probably from an application point of view, is still uh, too uh, low. But we have uh, also demonstrated that this circuit works properly if powered by a tiny solar cell, seven square millimeter solar cell, under in a dark room without. It has been tested the evening. The, the, the room was dark, so. So this suggests that based on this concept, uh, we were able to address the requirements, we we're truly able to address the requirements of uh, IoT, uh, IoT applications. Okay. Now let's uh, go ahead with another concept. Let's uh, talk about uh, uh, voltage references. Uh, I know that in Brazil there are many uh, researchers working on this uh, interesting uh, topic. Uh, let's uh, try to discuss if uh, also for what concerns uh, voltage and current references. Uh, is it uh, which are, of course, as we know, cornerstones of uh, analog electronics? If we can translate also these circuits into 
digital, it can be applied digital concepts to these circuits. Well, for this purpose, uh, let me introduce one new concept, that is the concept of the virtual voltage reference. Let's assume to have a, a system in which we have a digital to analog converter. I will show immediately at the end of my talk that these uh, digital to analog converter can be implemented by as a fully digital circuit so following the, the paradigm I have uh, introduced at the beginning. Let's suppose to have this uh, digital to analog converter uh, that is uh, working uh, with a, a reference voltage that is not accurate. For instance, that is obtained by a voltage divider of uh, 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 an inaccurate uh, supply voltage and provides uh, uh, an output, of course, that is uh, uh, n divided to uh, power n times this uh, inaccurate voltage. With reference to this uh, circuit, we can define uh, as a virtual voltage uh, reference uh, a binary number r that uh, if converted into analog by this uh, digital to analog converter referenced uh, to the uh, inaccurate, to the pseudo reference, provides uh, an output voltage uh, which is uh, independent of uh, process uh, supply voltage and uh, temperature. In other words, it's a, a constant uh, uh, reference uh, voltage. Of course, uh, the virtual voltage reference is a quantity that needs to be evaluated in real time that depends on process voltage and uh, temperature. Uh, we can conclude that if we have, if we know such a, a virtual voltage reference, we can convert it into analog using the digital to analog converter and we can obtain a, um, any reference uh, or any scaled version of the reference that we want. So it's a fully replacement of uh, a truly analog uh, voltage uh, reference. Now the point is how we can get, how can we calculate this binary number R? And uh, the answer is uh, by translating into digital the operation of the of a, of, a, of a band gap voltage reference like the QGIC circuit that I have uh, shown you uh, from the beginning. I will uh, illustrate this uh, focusing on how to compensate, uh, um, how to get a temperature independent uh, output voltage. But I would like to stress that uh, the same approach can be uh, refined uh, uh, so that to obtain uh, an output voltage which is also uh, independent uh, on uh, of the supply voltage uh, and uh, of uh, process. For the sake of illustration, I will discuss just uh, uh, the uh, temperature compensation. We know that uh, in uh, uh, band gap circuit, in particular in this huge uh, band gap circuit, uh, uh, temperature, a first order temperature independent reference voltage is uh, taken by summing uh, the uh, forward voltage of uh, a PN junction that uh, is known to have uh, a negative thermal drift uh, is complementary to the absolute uh, temperature plus uh, uh, um, proportional to absolute temperature voltage which is obtained taking the difference between the uh, forward uh, diode uh, voltages of two junctions uh, in which uh, uh, which are operated under different uh, current uh, under different current uh, density if we sum together these two terms with opposite thermal drift and we choose this coefficient uh, properly uh, we can get a reference voltage that indeed uh, is uh, about 1.12 volts, it's close to the band gap voltage of the silicon, which is first order, first order temperature independent. Now let's try to 
apply to translate into digital this approach so that to evaluate a virtual voltage reference. Now let's suppose to have an analog uh, um, uh, digital uh, hardware platform that includes a digital to analog converter, an analog to digital converter and a digital uh, processor. Uh, both the digital to analog converter and the analog to digital converter are um, referenced to the inaccurate pseudo reference uh, bit zero that in this case is is sampled is sampled is capacitor and uh, let's suppose that uh, uh, a diode which uh, can be regarded as a physical standard as a, a as a sensor, if you like, um, is, uh, is connected so that to be biased by the digital to analog converter and uh, so that uh, its forward voltage can be converted into digital by the analog to digital converter. If we apply a procedure that consists, of, if we convert uh, first a certain uh, number M1 into analog with the digital to analog converter and then we convert another uh, number m2 and then we acquire the corresponding output of the analog to digital converter we can have um, the digital values corresponding to pd the junction voltage to the diode voltage at uh, um, under the first bias M1 and to the diode voltage under the second bias M2 uh, at different current densities. Okay. If we assume we can sum together Obviously, from the diode voltage, we can also derive the difference between the two diode voltages. And if we sum, if we suppose to sum together these uh, voltage VD at the first bias and uh, delta VD between the first and uh, second bias, we can mimic, uh, we can get a reference voltage exactly as for the uh, traditional band gap circuit, which is uh, temperature independent. But uh, actually, we do not have uh, VD1 and uh, delta VD as uh, analog uh, voltages now. We have converted them into digital. What happens uh, if we replace uh, VD1 and uh, delta VD prime uh, with uh, we express in terms of their uh, output of the ADC um, referenced to the to the pseudo reference V0. Well actually we can we can write this expression that can be further put in this form that gives that the accurate temperature independent reference voltage is given by the pseudo reference V0 times a number, all this is a number that can be calculated and it is nothing but our virtual voltage reference. So by repeating this procedure, we can evaluate this uh, virtual voltage reference, and we can uh, obtain uh, a virtual voltage reference. Once we have obtained the virtual voltage reference, as we know, we can uh, generate uh, an output voltage proportional to this uh, temperature independent reference. And uh, if we acquire uh, any input uh, with the ADC reference to the pseudo reference, by knowing the virtual voltage reference R, we can translate the reading of the ADC reference to V0 to a reading reference to the 
accurate uh, temperature independent voltage reference. Okay. Well, in other words, in this way, we have uh, translated the behavior of the QCIC band, band gap into a software procedure, into an algorithm. Okay. Actually, this, is, uh, this algorithm is a little more complex because it involves also the compensation of the supply variations, which I have not discussed before. This uh, has been uh, implemented in simulations and uh, can be observed that depending on the resolution of the analog to digital converter and the digital to analog converter, we can uh, actually get uh, um, by reconverting the virtual reference, we can get a temperature independent voltage reference which shows first order temperature compensation uh, and um, as a, a thermal drift of uh, uh, 22 part per million uh, per degree in uh, the minus 40, 140 uh, Celsius degrees uh, range. And also considering that uh, we do not have two uh, dials or two transistors, but we have just a single device. This uh, uh, approach is very robust against the process variation. It's practically insensitive to process variation. Okay, this uh, has been uh, implemented. I have implemented it in a microcontroller-based uh, uh, proof of concept prototype uh, that I have tested over temperature and over um, power supply voltage variations. Uh, in this plot, uh, it, it can be observed uh, the um, pseudo reference that is actually the supply voltage of this board is not uh, obtained to a uh, um, uh, analog reference circuit uh, shows uh, a relevant uh, thermal drift. The virtual voltage reference that is uh, computed by the algorithm inside the microcontroller for each temperature uh, shows a different uh, thermal drift. Uh, by complementary thermal drift, by reconverting the virtual voltage reference with respect to the pseudo reference, we get the temperature independent reference voltage. Okay, well, actually I have uh, not uh, uh, verified uh, on silicon this approach, but I have realized that the very similar, very similar uh, of the same concept has been uh, adopted by colleagues at uh, TU Delft that have implemented it uh, uh, on silicon and uh, actually the, it's quite surprising that the uh, measured thermal drift of the silicon prototype is in very good agreement to what uh, has been obtained by the microcontroller based uh, prototype. So what are the advantages of uh, this approach? very low area overhead, especially if in a, in a system in which you have uh, already an analog to digital and a digital to analog converter. But even if it is not available, this can be very, very, the area overhead can be very, very small. Um, and uh, since uh, the compensation is uh, um, based on digital algorithms, a very high accuracy can be uh, targeted if more complex algorithms uh, are uh, employed. I have not shown for reasons of time, but this can be done. And uh, this is a, the, the, the voltage reference can be calculated just when needed. So it is intrinsically uh, duty cycled operation. So the average power consumption of this system can be very, very low. Now let's uh, go ahead. We have said that uh, um, Digital to analog conversion, as we have seen also for the virtual voltage reference, is a, is a key concept in the implementation of digital based analog uh, functions. Uh, 
actually this is not a, a completely new idea we have a, a digital pwm and a, a single bit sigma delta converters that are based on this concept that is to um, obtain an analog voltage by properly filtering a, a digital stream so that to get an analog output which is basically proportional to the number of uh, digital ones in a given uh, time uh, in a time interval corresponding to the impulse response of the filter uh, over the, uh, the duration of the impulse response okay uh, what we need in um, digital based analog interfaces anyway um, it's not just a midstream digital to analog conversion technique, but we need uh, something that can be implemented with very simple hardware so that to target low power, small area, and automated uh, design. And we also want that uh, the um, constraints, the requirements on the filters that need to be uh, put uh, are uh, non stringent. Otherwise, uh, you know, if we need the very low cost technology, this is not suitable to uh, uh, low cost technology. This, uh, mm, the first uh, requirement makes uh, Sigma Delta converters not so attractive for this target. The second requirement makes uh, um, digital PWM based converters not so, um, not so uh, well suited to this, uh, uh, to this application since uh, uh, in order to retrieve the uh, analog output there are very stringent uh, constraints on the uh, output uh, on the output field now uh, in view of these um, uh, limitations of these two mainstream uh, digital to analog conversion techniques uh, we have proposed a new uh, digital to analog conversion technique that is named uh, dyadic digital pulse modulation uh, we can introduce it uh, as a, a way to overcome the, to release the stringent filtering requirements of uh, uh, digital paths with uh, modulation. Okay, um, let's suppose we consider a 16-bit uh, stream. Uh, we want to get an output that is one half VDD in order to perform uh, Bitstream based DR conversion from digital pulse width modulation based DR conversion. We need to have eight slots at one and eight slots at zero. If we take the spectrum of this signal, of course, this is repeated periodically, we can see that most, of course, what we want is the DC is the analog value, converted analog value, the um, most of the uh, energy of uh, unwanted spurious components is uh, at the fundamental uh, frequency. That means very close to the bandwidth and very hard to be filtered. If we want to keep uh, the DC and we want to reject this uh, frequency that is very close to the DC, this is very challenging. It requires a very, very selective filter. Okay. But this is not the only possible way to perform uh, um, digital uh, um, stream based uh, uh, digital to analog conversion. Uh, instead of using, uh, uh, um, if we have uh, any other pattern, including the same number of ones, for instance, uh, the one which is reported here, in which we have uh, uh, evenly spaced uh, one uh, pulses, we may have uh, that uh, the uh, spectral content is pushed all to the to a much higher frequency. That means uh, it is much more easy to be uh, suppressed. If we apply the same uh, reasoning to the uh, output corresponding to one fourth of VDD, 25% duty cycle, we have the very same situation. We have that for digital PWM, the 
most of the spurious uh, components are close to the bandwidth and difficult to be suppressed. Whereas uh, for, we have uh, evenly spaced pulses, we push, uh, in this case, uh, it's no longer eight uh, times uh, the uh, fundamental, but it's just four times the fundamental frequency, the frequency at which we have pushed the uh, energy of the spurious components. But we have also to observe that uh, compared to the previous case, uh, the amplitude of the spurious components is also less. It means that this is not more hard to be filtered. We can go ahead for two pulses. We can go to the very same considerations. One pulse, in this case, the digital PWM and uh, the approach in which we have evenly spaced uh, pulses are uh, exactly the same. We get that uh, um, the new um, patterns that we have introduced for one half VDD, one fourth VDD, one eighth VDD, one sixteenth VDD show better spectral properties than digital uh, PWM. If we arrange these patterns so that to be non overlapping, that is orthogonal, we can get that if we sum the waveforms related to these patterns, uh, weighted by the weight of a binary number to be converted, at the end, we can obtain a digital bit stream that is a superposition of these signals which, with favorable spectral properties that has a number of pulses which is exactly equal to the digital number to be converted. Okay. If we compare the spectral characteristics of the uh, streams obtained in this way, that is actually the dyadic digital pulse modulation, compared to the digital pulse width modulation, we can say that now most of the energy is pushed at higher frequencies, while at lower frequency, we have a very limited amount of energy that makes it very, very easy to be be filtered. Also, if we look at the time domain waveforms, we can see that the uh, we filter this DDPM stream uh, compared, for instance, uh, last plot with the output of a um, single bit uh, sigma delta converter. We can observe that if we sample these. Uh, filtered output at a given time instant, we have that the deviation of uh, due to the ripple, to the residual ripple uh, on this voltage from the expected value is always less than one half least significant bit, which is not true for the sigma delta converter in which we may have uh, an error up to plus four minus four least significant bits, okay? This is, makes this technique very suitable to the conversion of uh, DC quantities. Actually, the good news is that uh, this uh, technique can be implemented by very, very simple digital hardware, which is actually a um, priority multiplexer driven by a binary con counter. It works in this way. If we have uh, the least significant bit of the counter to one, that is uh, every other cycle, uh, we keep the most significant bit uh, of the input to be converted. So we have uh, one half slots assigned to the most significant bit. If the least significant bit of the counter is zero and uh, the second least significant bit uh, is one, that means uh, every other of the time slots in which, uh, which have not been uh, assigned to the most significant bit before. Well, in this case, uh, that uh, actually are one fourth of the total uh, time slots, uh, we uh, apply to the output the second most significant bit and so on. 
can be immediate to observe that the number of pulses which is assigned to each bit is equal to the weight of that bit in the binary uh, representation of, uh, of the input. Well, this uh, technique uh, has been ad adopted to design uh, several uh, digital uh, to uh, analog converters that have been uh, integrated on silicon in uh, 40 uh, nanometers and has also been uh, adopted to um, perform uh, analog to uh, digital conversion. Uh, thanks to this technique, um, we have developed the fully synthesizable 12-bit uh, uh, 110 kilo sample per second uh, digital to analog converter that shows uh, ultra low area is just 270 square micrometers. It draws uh, um, 50 uh, about 50 microwatt at one volt supply, but it works also fine down to 0 0.7 volts. Um, and uh, as uh, not uh, the state of the art of digital to analog converters, but shows uh, uh, quite a uh, uh, reasonable figure of merit for what merits for what concerns uh, um, the energy, uh, the energy uh, efficiency. Okay. We have also designed a 16 bit uh, digital to analog converter that shows a very good uh, static uh, uh, accuracy that is uh, uh, plus minus uh, 3.1 LSBs uh, with uh, digital calibration. And uh, um, actually the dynamics perf dynamic performance of this circuit are probably impaired by the um, clock signal, which was not uh, um, very high quality. It was internally generated and was quite noisy. By the way, the 16-bit uh, operation in static condition has, conditions has been, uh, has been uh, demonstrated. OK? Now, these results have been published in this paper. If you want, I invite you to see the paper to see the full comparison with the state of the art. A remarkable uh, feature is that the uh, linearity, total harmonic distortion, spurious free dynamic range of this, uh, uh, if we neglect noise, just to see the linearity is very, very good. Following using this approach, we have uh, also developed, um, uh, um, we applied the digital concepts like uh, the concepts of uh, graceful performance, performance degradation uh, by properly designing the um, binary counter and uh, by properly designing the priority MOOCs. Uh, we, um, made this uh, uh, circuit degrading gracefully when the supply voltage is overscaled or where the clock frequency is overscaled. Uh, this is due to the fact that the critical paths are shorter for the most significant bits, whereas they are uh, longer, the lowest is the uh, significance of the bit in the digital input world. These are the results that basically um, confirm the graceful performance degradation as well as the reconfigurability of this uh, digital to analog convert. As I have mentioned before, these are very simple, fully synthesizable digital circuits uh, that have very released requirements in the filters. They work with a fully integrated, I have I omitted to say that they work with a fully integrated uh, circuit uh, that is uh, uh, a few thousand square micrometers uh, that is uh, well integrated uh, in the uh, technology without uh, an excessive uh, 
area overhead are suitable to DC conversion, as we have said, and enable also concepts like uh, digital, uh, um, like uh, graceful performance degradation and power resolution scaling. As I have uh, mentioned, uh, by connecting uh, these uh, uh, DDPM-based uh, DACs uh, in uh, uh, negative feedback uh, uh, configuration and by including in the loop uh, a successive approximation uh, uh, register, we uh, um, developed uh, um, two uh, uh, analog to digital converters that are um, based on uh, successive approximation registers, basically, basically the, uh, the output of the uh, DDPM DAC is updated uh, based uh, on this uh, successive approximation uh, register logic till uh, the uh, voltage uh, at uh, the input of this uh, digital buffer uh, reaches the, uh, the trip point. By using the output of this buffer uh, in the uh, successive approximation uh, uh, register uh, logic, uh, we um, obtained uh, at, at the end of the conversion uh, the content of the um, input register of the prior of, of the DDPM converter is uh, proportional, is linear with the uh, uh, input voltage applied in this circuit. By using the same approach, but uh, a different uh, circuit configuration, we uh, also implemented uh, a um, DDPM-based analog to digital converter that uh, uh, is suitable to convert a current input rather than a, a voltage input. So it can be um, particularly useful for sensors which provide uh, uh, intrinsically a, a current output rather than a, a voltage output. Okay, we have uh, measured uh, the performance of these ADCs. There are eight bit two kilo samples per second ADC. Um, again, uh, the results uh, of the measurements uh, were affected by noise that made not possible to fully uh, highlight the potential of the approach, but we can uh, still observe uh, um, very good uh, um, linearity, 8-bit linearity, and uh, also um, we can uh, observe that uh, the uh, implemented circuits are very, very small, 3,000 square micrometers and 5,000 square micrometers. I have mentioned this uh, analog to digital converters because the Bitstream uh, digital to analog converter together with the analog to digital converter obtained using the Bitstream digital to analog converter make it possible to implement the generic input and the generic output in that uh, system, very general uh, digital based analog system which I have introduced at the beginning. So. Coming to the conclusions of my talk, I hope uh, I have convinced you that there is an alternative approach to address the challenges of integrated uh, analog interfaces in uh, IoT applications rather than adapting traditional design methodologies which are analog in concept to the requirements of digital process. One idea is to try to design digital circuits which implement, uh, which implement the same functions of uh, used in, in analog interfaces. Uh, I have shown how this is possible. This approach can be used to implement an operational transconductor amplifier and uh, voltage reference. And uh, I think it is quite uh, uh, obvious that being this circuit uh, truly digital circuit, they fully take advantage of all the advantages of digital circuits. That is, they are scaling friends friendly. We have seen this for the digital OTA. Yeah, they are matching insensitive. They are robust against uh, uh, PVT variations. 
uh, allow ultra low voltage, ultra low power operation, are energy efficient, are reconfigurable, and finally, uh, allow also fast uh, design uh, with very low uh, manpower, with very low uh, effort, and very important portability across technology. What I want to say is that, uh, of course, these are the very first uh, prototypes uh, that uh, are based on these uh, uh, ideas. So they actually show the limitations. But uh, what I want to say is that uh, I do not see any fundamental performance limitation in uh, this approach. So I suggest that working more on these uh, circuits, on these techniques, and I also invite uh, you all uh, who are uh, involved in uh, working in research in uh, this field to consider this uh, uh, alternative approach in the implementation of uh, uh, analog functions, because I believe it can be uh, very, very uh, interesting. I want to thank you uh, for your attention, and uh, that's all for my talk. I would like also to thank uh, all the guys uh, who work with me at the Politecnico di Torino. I know that one of them for sure is uh, connected here, is following this talk. And uh, for some part of this research, I would also acknowledge the funding of the uh, European uh, Commission. Thank you very much for your attention. I cannot hear you, Sergio. Thank you, Professor Paolo Crovetti, for your very interesting talk, covering uh, this uh, very large field uh, from the OTA references, ADC, DACs, uh, with uh, you know mostly digital implementation, which is a very very nice and uh, very very hot topic. Um, Thank you know, you, uh, as you as you uh, as you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, on tackling the voltage reference, okay, the the DC voltage reference. Uh, since you can uh, use a very low, uh, very, let's say, very low uh, sampling rate for the uh, for the ADC, and you tested that implemented with uh, twelve bit uh, uh, ADCs. So, what do you see for the voltage reference implementation? Uh, uh, you know what's what's the power uh, you know the power constraint there comes from the from the high precision uh, ADC that's what it, taking most of the area and most of the uh, of the power for for the voltage reference. Uh, well, actually, uh, in the first uh, uh, estimates of the power that I have uh, made. Uh, I have uh, found uh, uh, an activity factor, the, the, the percentage, uh, the time percentage uh, uh, at which the um, ADC and the DAC are actually used uh, is very low. It can be uh, 10 power minus 4. So even if these blocks could be rather power consuming, I have assumed in that uh, um, in the, in the first paper, uh, I have considered the state-of-the-art uh, analog to digital and digital to analog converter. I have not considered the low power implementations at all. Uh, considering state-of-the-art uh, analog to digital and digital to analog converters, uh, the uh, average power consumption by using the, the, which can be obtained by using the virtual voltage reference in this duty cycle mode, uh, active just from uh, for uh, 10 power minus 4 uh, part uh, of uh, the time with a duty cycle that is 10 power minus 4 can be as low as in the nanowatt range. But I guess that uh, if we consider possibly high resolution uh, but uh, simpler uh, analog to digital converter and digital to, digital to analog converter architecture, the average power consumption can be much, much less. Let me also say to, to better uh, focus this, uh, this point, uh, what is uh, the limit? Basically, the, what fixes the sampling time? 
assuming uh, that uh, the, uh, virtu the the, the pseudo-reference is sampled, so basically the, the, the supply voltage uh, is stored on, on a capacitor and is used as a pseudo-reference for the uh, ADC and for the DAC, uh, the limit is given by the uh, discharge time due to leakage of the capacitor. So it can be orders of order of seconds. Okay. Okay. We have another question here uh, from uh, Rodrigo Verdic, uh, a computer engineering student. Um, he thanks you for your talk, Professor Provetti. The question is: Do you see any application of this those fully digital amplifiers circuits as a neutral low voltage SRAM sense amplifier? So. Question is, uh, do you see application on this very dense uh, digital uh, SRAM uh, as a sense amplifier? Yes, uh, I think it could be. It, it could be considered the application as a, a sense amplifier. Actually, this is not. This was not the um, main uh, uh, application domain for for which this technique has been focused because uh, we uh, targeted the. Uh, as also in the title of the talk, we mostly targeted the Internet of Things applications, but also uh, biomedical applications. But uh, I believe that uh, uh, this uh, concept, uh, probably including uh, some uh, uh, positive feedback, could be also used. Why not as a, as a sense amplifier? It should be. It should be definitely tested. Thank you for this uh, suggestion. Yeah, it's a comparator indeed, more than an amplifier. Uh, with yeah, yes. okay. of course, and I have also tested that this, 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 the circuit works as a, works nicely uh, as a comparator. It mm -hmm. has, uh, I have also tested in my paper as a comparator, it works uh, uh, properly. What uh, um, is worth being considered carefully is uh, if this could be uh, so uh, appealing in the sense amplifier uh, application. Another question from uh, Paulo Aguirre from the chapter here in South Brazil. Uh, thank you for this very interesting and inspiring talk. Uh, may you comment a little bit about the maximum operating frequency of the proposed digitally based uh, ADC or DACs? Yes, uh, uh, maybe let me show. The um, operating frequency basically is uh, uh, dictated by the, let's focus for instance uh, on the uh, DAC. The operating frequency uh, in this uh, um, DDPM uh, um, operating mode, since the DDPM stream uh, consists of two power n uh, bits. Uh, the operating frequency is the clock frequency divided the two power n. By the way, it's worth being observed that these are not oversampled converters. Actually, these are Nyquist rate converters that generate an output every uh, two power n uh, clock cycles. Uh, let me also say another thing, comparing to um, digital uh, um, to analog converters featuring uh, uh, noise, uh, uh, noise shaping, uh, this approach could be more convenient, for instance, if you want to convert a DC value. Because uh, actually, even if you, um, let me say, one, one thing that uh, oversampled converters are intended, in my view, to uh, approximate a signal, whereas these uh, Nyquist rate converters are uh, intended to approximate a voltage value, a voltage value per sample. Okay. I have uh, asked, uh, I have answered properly to your question. So, is uh, okay. the clock frequency divided the two power n? And for the uh, successive approximation register based ADC, that actually is based on this technique, it is uh, two power 
clock frequency divided Q power n divided the n bits, uh, the n cycles uh, requested for the um, successive approximation uh, register uh, algorithm. Yeah, and it's okay. indeed very, very compact uh, implementation of the yes, yes. So here you are, it's very, very compact. Well, uh, uh, you no, know, we have uh, this video available here in the YouTube channel of the chapter. Uh, I don't see any more questions. It's been a very productive and very interesting, and with the key concepts uh, for analog and signal processing with digital, uh, mostly digital, uh, uh, you know, implementation. Those are very, very interesting and, and you know, uh, frontier opening, uh, uh, let's say, work that came out of uh, Professor Corvetti's group. So um, I thank you again, uh, Professor Corvetti, for uh, coming to, the, to this uh, webinar and delivering such a, a very, a very interesting and very, uh, let's say, challenging for new concepts uh, in terms of the analog and digital so blurring the boundaries in a new and different way of, of our mixed signal. So that's very, very interesting, very important, and uh, you know, state-of-the-art results. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. And uh, Thank I, you. I call uh, every one of you here in Cyberland to, to stay tuned for the next uh, October 14 uh, distinguished talk uh, on RF and microfluidics, and antennas integrated with microfluidics. So for your last statement and last uh, words, Professor Crovetti, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sergio. Thank you all for attending this, uh, uh, this webinar. I hope uh, you found uh, these uh, ideas interesting. I, I am also glad uh, to, if you have uh, any comments, uh, anything you want to share with me, I am more, I invite you to, to Write, uh, write me an email. Uh, I think there is a, there could be always uh, uh, good occasions for uh, sharing uh, new ideas, uh, new concepts, uh, new applications of these uh, uh, these approaches. So thank you again, Sergio. Thank you all for attending, and thank you for giving me the uh, opportunity to to give this talk. And hopefully, see you. Uh, in uh, in other uh, uh, occasions uh, thank you thank you very much and have a, a good day uh, sorry for two questions that i missed here there are still many questions outstanding from uh, uh, pedro and toledo and with co-author of the digital water ota and also co-author uh, newton Klimak. Uh so uh, certainly uh, we'll be seeing you in the chapter very soon thank you very much you're welcome bye so uh, now we have